But you've probably heard it said that if you want to learn about someone, look at their calendar and their bank account. Because both of those are finite and limited resources. None of us have unlimited time, and I don't know anyone who truly has unlimited money. So how we spend our time and our money reveals a lot about what we think is really important and what we really value. But there's another way to gain insight into what someone holds dear. Listen to their prayers. Listen to the things that they lift up before God. I love the prayers in our Book of Common Prayer, but I also love to hear the prayers of the saints that come from their heart and their mind as they speak to God. In the lesson from chapter 3 of Ephesians, which was read, we get to listen in on the Apostle Paul's prayer for the people of Ephesus. And in this prayer, we are able to get an idea of his love for these people and the deepest longing of his heart for them. It also, I think, gives us a pattern, a guide for praying for one another and for the church today. But we need to understand that in chapter 2 of Ephesians, Paul outlines the basics of the gospel itself. In fact, if you ever need a quick biblical outline of the gospel to share with someone, Ephesians 2, 1 through 11 is a great summary of the basics of the gospel. In that passage, Paul talks about our condition apart from Christ, the great inheritance of salvation that is ours. And in Ephesians 2, 4, and 5, we have these wonderful lines, but God being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which He loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together in Christ. By grace, you have been saved. A wonderful summary. But it's important for us to make this connection between the gospel itself and Paul's prayer today because Paul's prayer only makes sense in light of the gospel that he proclaims. His prayer is rooted in his conviction about who Jesus is, what Jesus has done, and what Jesus will do in the lives of those who believe in Him. This is what drives the Apostle to his knees. Now, verse 14 in today's passage has some context for us when he says, for this reason, what reason? For the reason of the Gospel itself. And for you, Ephesians, I bow my knees before the Father. And what's interesting is the bowing of the knee for us is a normal way of talking about prayer. For the Jews of the time, that was not the normal posture of prayer. The normal posture of prayer was standing. The Pharisee and the tax collector, they're standing in the temple praying. To kneel was a sign of a, a sense of reverence, a humility, and earnestness. It was a special posture of prayer for them. When Jesus is in the Garden of Gethsemane, He hits His knees in earnestness, humility, and reverence before God. And so Paul, you can imagine his prayer, it's more than something done in a perfunctory manner or as some sort of stoic recitation. This is heartfelt pleading before God for this church. And it is a prayer that the, God, that the gospel that has been proclaimed will become an experienced reality for every member of the church. And I think we need that in our own day as well. It's great to express belief in the tenets of the faith. But what each of us needs is the lived experience of the truthfulness and reliability and presence of Jesus Himself in our lives. And that is what this prayer of Paul's is asking. In this prayer, we see four distinct things that Paul prays for. Strength, love, knowledge, 
and fullness. Verses 16 and 17, if you'd like to follow along. Begin the petitions of this prayer. He says, According to the riches of His, that is God's glory, may He grant you to be strengthened with power through His Spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. Strengthening with power through His Spirit. Every believing and baptized Christian is given the Holy Spirit. We pray this in the baptismal liturgy. When we pray at the end of the service, just sustain them, O Lord, in your Holy Spirit, that they may enjoy everlasting salvation through Jesus Christ our Lord. What Paul is praying for here is not just the reception of this gift, but that the believers in Ephesus would experience the strengthening grace and power of the Holy Spirit in their lives. It's the desire, I think, of every pastor, every priest, or it should be, that the gospel not only convinces minds, but transforms lives. I mean, that's the real meaning of regeneration. It is the bringing to life of something that was previously dead. It is the people of God being strengthened by the power of God for the service of God to the glory of God. And I've seen this prayer answered. I've seen it answered in the newly baptized who give themselves fully to the faith that they have embraced. I have seen this answered as people who have attended church sometimes for decades have the penny drop and yield to the Holy Spirit in their lives. And when this happens, buckle up. Marriages are healed. Relationships restored. Hope renewed. Peace experienced. A sense of the love and goodness of God moves from theory to reality. How? By the indwelling Christ. What Paul is praying for in the last phrase of that particular petition when he says, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith is a very specific request. He has the choice of using two Greek words there. One means to stay a little while. Like we might stay in a hotel one night and move and drive to another city and stay in another one. The other Greek word that he can use means to take up residence and live permanently as a citizen. That's the word he used to describe that Christ may dwell in your hearts. Not that Jesus would be an occasional guest, but that Jesus by His Spirit would truly and permanently make His home in your heart. And He will. He will. That brings us to the second petition, which is that the Ephesians would be rooted and grounded in love. And the discussion of love is, has, makes up two petitions in his prayer. The first discussion of love is our love. The second is Christ's love. So our love first. With the power of the Holy Spirit, Christ dwelling permanently in our hearts, love becomes the identifying trait of the church. Jesus prays this specifically Himself in John 13, 35, when He tells His disciples, By this all people will know that you are My disciples, if you have love for one another. It's the love expressed within the community of faith that is the best evidence that this is indeed a community of faith. Paul is praying for the strengthening of this church to love. Anglican John Stott says the new humanity is God's family whose members are brothers and sisters who love their father and love each other. Paul uses two metaphors back to back to describe the place of love 
in the church. One is agricultural and one is architectural. Rooted and grounded. A steadfast tree needs roots, deep roots, strong roots. The stable building needs to be grounded on a firm foundation. And that is what Christ-empowered love does for the community of faith. In a day where our culture seeks to divide and pit people against one another, where it is tempted to be rooted, where it is tempting, sorry, to be rooted and grounded in tribalism, ideology, and politics, where it is tempting to draw hard lines between those we will love and those we will despise, the church of Jesus is called to be different. It is called to be a place where love for one another and love for God is the basis for community. So Paul's prayer is that the church would see this as not some sort of add-on to their spiritual life, but as foundational roots and foundation to who they are as God's people. But then the question comes, of course, how can we love like Jesus? How can we be the kind of people who can love God and one another as we should? It is by knowing, truly knowing, the love of Christ. Look at verse 18. Paul prays that they may have strength to comprehend with all the saints. This is something found in community. What is the breadth and length and height and depth to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge? If we're going to love like Christ, we need to know the love of Christ ourselves. And Paul is praying again that we do more than simply affirm the fact of God's love, but know the love of Christ as a lived experience. And I think Stott is helpful again when he says, the love of Christ is broad enough to encompass all mankind, long enough to last for eternity, deep enough to reach the most degraded sinner, and high enough to exalt him to heaven. Paul prays that the Ephesians would truly know the love of Christ and how totally encompassing it is. Here's the truth. There's more love in Him than sin in us. There's more love in Him than pain we carry. There is more love in Him than the doubts that trouble us. There is more love in Him than our most embarrassing failure. There is more love in Him than in even our best efforts at being good. There is more love in Him than we imagine. And this can be hard for us, though. Because this isn't the kind of love we're used to. We are still victims of a positively damning deception of the evil one. It is a lie, and it is this. The lie is that I am loved only as mu- in as much as I deserve to be loved. That is a lie. And if I could pour it into everybody's mind and heart, I would. To help you understand this, that you are loved because God has set His love on you. It is not because you or I earned it or deserve it, We are loved because the love of God in Christ is lavish and generous and powerful. Unlike every image of love that we see on earth. And we are free to love when we are secure in that love ourselves. 
That is the love that Paul wants the Ephesians to know. That is the love he wants us to know. Paul knows that when we begin to know this love and begin to get just a glimpse of how broad and long and high and deep the love of Christ is, we are changed by it. We are set free by the all-encompassing love of Jesus. So Paul's prayer is like a ladder. He wants us to climb closer to the Lord by being strengthened by the Holy Spirit, being rooted and grounded in love, and by knowing the true nature of the love of Christ. And finally, he prays that we will be filled, in verse 19, with all the fullness of God. The idea here is one of growth, of, one, of a process of being filled continually. When we were in the Dominican Republic, we were filled continually. It felt like we were eating every 20 minutes. They are very generous with their food. That's one of the ways they show love and hospitality is by feeding you. In the middle of the day when it's 90 degrees and 97% humidity, why not have a big old bowl of beans and rice and chicken and a cup of coffee? But here's the truth we know about eating, right? You eat now. That's not the last time you need to eat. You're going to need to eat again. That is the way it is in spiritual growth. We are fed. We grow. We need to be fed again. And then grow. And then be fed again and grow. And this is the idea that Paul is saying that you may be filled with all the fullness of God constantly. Until we reach heaven and you are filled to capacity. Forever. We are meant to grow into the fullness of faith, to develop in our Christian life, to grow more into the mind and heart of Jesus, to reflect the kingdom of God in our lives, to serve others, to live in deeper and deeper obedience to the Word of God. And that's what Paul is praying for. That may sound impossible. It may sound like a big task, an intimidating thought. And maybe it did to the Ephesians as well, which is why I think Paul closes this this passage the way he does. As if he anticipates us going, I don't know, that sounds awfully difficult. He says this. He points us back to God. Now to Him, who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we can ask or think, according to the power that is at work within us, to Him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Paul's prayer for the Ephesians and for us is not a pipe dream for the super saintly among us. It is the common call for each of us. And if it is the Lord's will for His people, the Lord will help us along the way. And He will help us in ways that we can't even ask or think right now. Because it is God's power at work in us working for His glory. So what do we do with this prayer of Paul's? My suggestion is that we pray it. There are four petitions in this prayer which can be prayed for anyone because they are applicable to everyone. There are always certain things people need in their lives, things that we need in our lives that we pray for. Maybe someone's looking for a job, or maybe they're having relationship difficulties, or maybe someone's sick in their family. Those things change and move as we change and go through life. But these four things that Paul outlines for the Ephesians make up a prayer that we can pray for one another all the time. Husbands, pray this prayer for your wives and see what God will do. Wives, pray this prayer for your husband. See what God will do. Parents, what better prayer to pray for your children than this prayer from Ephesians 3? 
parents, I mean children, pray for mom and dad. They need this too. What more could we want for one another than what is laid out so beautifully in this prayer? What could be better for our souls than this? May we make Paul's prayer our prayer for one another in the church. That we would be strengthened by the Holy Spirit. That we would be rooted and grounded in love. That we would know the love of Christ deeply. And that we would be filled with all the fullness of God. To know the life He intends for us. This is a prayer for all God's people all the time. I pray for you. Please pray for me too. Amen.